Welcome to Pookie Ponders, the podcast where I explore big questions with brilliant people. I'm Dr Pookie Knightsmith and I'm your host. Today I'm in conversation with Anthony McCann. His main work is as a specialist ADHD coach and trainer for ADHD awareness. He also works internationally as a public speaker. He was diagnosed with adult ADHD at the age of 44 and believes passionately that a deeper understanding of how the ADHD brain body works can lead us to helpfully transform our personal and our professional lives. In today's episode, we explored, can striving to be authentic about a lived experience of ADHD risk harm? But we did a lot of exploration of what ADHD is and isn't first. Anthony was fascinating to talk to, and I could have gone in any one of a hundred directions with his ideas. I hope you enjoy our chat. Um, can we start by, uh, could you introduce yourself? So I sometimes introduce people, but I always think that the introductions are more interesting when they come from you, because I want to know what you care about you. <laughs> what I care about me, well, introductions were always a difficult thing for me, because what I care about me is is... I get myself into trouble because I don't like the labels. I don't like the hats, you know, that that, that we're expected to wear one hat because it doesn't confuse people. Mm -hmm. uh, so the one hat that I wear to not confuse people is ADHD coach. So that's okay. what I do on a day-to-day -day basis. So I work with clients, mainly adults or parents of children mm -hmm. uh, who like myself have had difficulties become, because of the kind of brain that we have. And uh, I also research that as well so i worked as an academic for about 20 years in lots of different disciplines and now i apply that understanding and that knowledge and that kind of method investigatory habit into yep. thinking about adhd and trying to make sense of adhd from the inside out uh, because one of the things that frustrates me greatly in, in a lot of these different mental health conversations is how much we are made sense of by other people who don't actually have an experiential understanding of of what we are going through um so that's very very important um there's a lot in there okay so can you talk to me a little bit about adhd and why that's kind of you know a big important part of what you're doing both professionally and personally well as you as you know yourself you know when you have a particular kind of brain it, it, it is your life. It's your experience. It's every part of you. So one of the things that, that has fascinated me about thinking about this conversation about ADHD, mm -hmm. um, because it's complex as to who accepts what and who says what and where, how and when. One of the fascinating things for me is, is looking back through my history of, of theoretical work, looking back through my history of interests and, and seeing how particular aspects of this kind of brain, particular aspects of this kind of approach to experience have infused absolutely every single aspect of my life. And, uh, and also how all of the things that I've been interested in throughout the years now add up to a kind of cumulative pool of insight about how this brain works and how this body works and how this personality works. And one of the things that I've been keen to do in, in my work thinking about ADHD from the inside out is to get away from the broken brain model uh, yeah. because I find that very powerful and quite insidious in some ways, uh, not in any conspiracy theory way, but in a, in a deeply unhelpful way. I, I think of myself in some ways as a recovery coach. So what I do is I, I, I help people design a more helpful approach to their own lives uh, for wow. themselves. Okay. And if you have a model that says your brain is essentially and inherently broken, that it needs fixing, that it, that it, that it somehow has something wrong with it, you know, disordered or dysfunctional or deficient in some way, you know, with these um, executive function deficits and with these uh, kind of dopamine, low dopamine problems and all this sort of thing. If you have that idea that somehow we need to be fixed a bit to make us more like all the other neurotypical people. Yeah. I find that, well, first of all, it undermines anything you might do in terms of recovery, uh, yeah. and it leads to what is effectively a steady state understanding of whatever these difficulties are that we're having. And 
first and foremost, people with these kinds of brains tend not to like steady state anything. We like movement, we like fluidity, we like you know, process, we like dynamics. So that was one of the things I, I, I very much resisted uh, as soon as I got my diagnosis was I, was, I became very aware of what the orthodoxies were of the stories that people were telling. Yeah. I have a deep respect for neuropsychology. I have a deep respect for psychiatry. Uh, I am pro-medication um, mm -hmm. in the sense that I take medication and it helps me, but I don't accept the, the narratives that people are using to explain why the medication works because I'm, I'm trying to work at finding other ones because the ones that were there didn't seem to satisfy my experience of it or my clients' experiences of it. So what, what fascinates me about that conversation is that there seems to me to be a very distinctive kind of brain, uh, which makes up about five, maybe as much as 10, but certainly five to 7% of the population. Mm -hmm. And we experience, in terms of the work I've been doing, we've, we experience consciousness and experience itself in a very different way. And we have certain core features that allow us to make sense of the world in a, in, a, in a very distinctive way, but in a way which leads to quite a bit of dissonance with the world around us, which was not designed with us in mind. And I'm sure you would appreciate these issues yourself. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, so that issue of having the world not being designed for us, fair enough, we don't need it to be designed for us. We're not that arrogant. At least some of us might not be, but the, um, uh, I might be. Uh, so, <laughs> I was gonna say, I wouldn't mind. <laughs> you know, it would be great. But that question of, of, of the interface is where I see the disordering. It's where I see the disability and the disabling processes taking place. I was deeply disabled by what I experienced. I was, yeah. you know, experienced profound disordering. I was almost catatonic walking around the house to the extent that my wife believed that I had possibly got early onset Alzheimer's. Wow. You know, I, I had pretty much entered a dissociative state where I was wandering around just unable to connect with the world around me. So the disability can be real, the dissociation can be real, the, 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 the quality of disorder can be very real, mm -hmm. but where we locate that has huge implications for how we think about you know, treatment, recovery, whatever it is, do we locate it within the brain in terms of some essential features? Do we locate it in the interface between us and the world? Do we only locate it in the world? And, and we have no part in it. So where we locate that is very important. And for me, I locate it in the interface. Uh, and that's, that's how I think about the ADHD style brain as I tend to, tend to think about it. So just to backpedal slightly, I'm always aware that people listening in will have more or less understanding of things. Can you just explain like what would be the kind of the textbook definition, if you like, of ADHD, what do normally people think of when we think ADHD and how does that compare with how you would maybe um, explain it or explore it with your clients? Absolutely. So people tend to talk about ADHD in terms of, well, they used to talk about it very clearly before diagnostic changes took place was it last year, the year before. Um, talk about in terms of hyperactivity, uh, impulsivity, and inattention. Mm -hmm. uh, now, hyperactivity has the stereotype of the, the, the crazy boy in the classroom who can't sit still and causes trouble. Yeah. Um, the uh, impulsivity has the, you know, always makes me think of the marshmallow test and the, <laughs> yeah. um, for me, rather questionable consequences of the marshmallow test where people were, you know, saying that people are deeply impulsive and they, they rush at things and they can be reckless and they can, you know, make decisions before thinking about, you know, the consequences of it or just have no understanding of consequences whatsoever. Um, and then the third thing would be inattention, which would be that, that people just are just always somewhere else um, and floating off and not interested in, you know, what's in front of them. Now, for me, those three kind of diagnostic criteria that people tend to go for, and you can be either hyperactive type according to the diagnostic criteria, you can be um, impulsive, um, or again, if you can be in inattentive type, hyperactive type, or combined. Mm -hmm. um, and for me, one of the, the, the difficult things is that that's people looking at us from the outside. Okay. That's, that's an, 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 you know, it, and it links into a lot of the behaviorist observable symptoms issues going back historically. But, you know, what, what was observable about these people? How are they deviant from the rest of us? And how can we find ways to classify them in a way that, that, that maybe makes them a little bit less deviant or, or you know, 
puts them in a box somewhere that makes them more um, kind of understandable and, and handleable with, uh, to make up a very bad word. So that was very interesting to me because something in the back of my head, and this is very classic with this brain, something in my back, back of my head was going, doesn't feel right, doesn't feel right, little alarm bells going off. This, this, <laughs> Yeah, because you know, that wasn't how I experienced things. So the stories that people then use to explain that within the kind of neuropsychology zone tend to be things like, there's a number of them, but what common ones are one going around that um, we have low dopamine production, therefore we crave high dopamine production and we, 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 we dash off trying to get these dopamine hits all over the place and that we're, yeah. we have to be buzzing all the time to be happy and all these sorts of things. Okay, I'll say it now, that's a myth. Uh, maybe explain that later. Um, mm -hmm. Another uh, story is that we've got exec executive function deficits that, um, that somehow the front frontal lobe part of our brain, I've said this in videos myself at the beginning of my coaching career. Uh, they're on YouTube if you wanna watch them. I wouldn't, I wouldn't recommend it. Um, <laughs> about how you know, our executive function's broken in our brain and you know, therefore we can't do administration and bureaucracy as well as other people. Uh, but we can take stimulants, which helps us fix that a little bit, and we can reconnect with that. There's a lot of discussion about what executive function actually means. Um, and there have been articles written which identify kind of up to 40 different understandings of executive oh, function. Oh, wow. Okay. <laughs> uh, and, and also, it's very, very influenced by uh, models from the business world where the, you know, the whole question of executive function you know, also ties into... That, that book, The Executive Brain, which was republished and re-edited re in second edition, came out recently, uh, which, which very much influences this conversation as well as to what are, what are the qualities in the executive brain that are connected to this prefrontal lobe and, and connected yeah. to the ways in which we are in the world. And then that, in turn, connects to conversations which are deeply embedded mm -hmm. about productivity. Uh, which yeah. are very common in disability studies conversations, you know, about, you know, who's, who's productive, who's not productive. Um, yeah. and, and to jump forward a bit, one of the things that fascinates me about that is that, um, I don't know if you've read the authoring um, autism book, kind of neuroqueer work about autism. No, but I, it sounds like I need to. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's an excellent book, but it's, it's one of the, it, it identifies one of the ways people tend to talk about autism as a kind of a failure of communication and it's okay. kind of this, it's on a sort of communication deficit. If, if autism is in the stories that people tell about it is framed as a communications deficit, for me, very frequently ADHD brains are framed as having a, and people are framed as having a, a productivity deficit that, that we aren't, we aren't working well enough and product, uh, producing well enough in the modern world to be to be good enough at, at the admin and the bureaucracy and the you know Ouch. production line and, and stuff and, and that's how it tends to be presented okay. is uh, we don't fit very well and therefore we're not productive enough and we don't things don't do things um, smoothly enough and frictionlessly enough to yeah. to fit with the, the modern world of production and industrial industrial life so so that's sort of one of the stories that tends to be thrown around with the executive function and and then there are there are a number of other ones that have to do with you know how fast or how slow the synapses fire and all that sort of stuff and various other various other ones then there's the other one which is very very um dominant which is the whole question about uh, emotional dysregulation mm -hmm. um and effectively though people won't say it out loud it's effectively a narrative about emotional retardation mm -hmm. um that we are developmentally delayed in terms of our emotional regulation um, and again, people don't say it as they really mean it. They don't, they call it, you know, developmental delay. They don't call it emotional retardation, but it's the same model that they're because using. Because it's unpalatable or, I mean, what, what? I imagine so. I imagine they'd certainly get a little bit more bite back and, and, and <laughs> backwash, blowback, um, if, if that were the case, um, if they could call it that. And, and again, that was something that didn't feel right to no. me um, and that I felt that if, if what people were seeing was impulsivity and hyperactivity and emotional dysregulation and all these sorts of things, surely there was something else going on under that, which I could make sense of through my experience and, and working with clients and trying to make sense of their experience. And I, I went diving into a rather unfashionable area, personality theory. 
um, and I went diving back 150 years into public personality theory and uh, back through the unfashionable and for in, in many ways unpalatable uh, async um, and his work uh, back through there, um, not the IQ stuff, not the racism stuff, uh, <laughs> back into the personality. Yes, it's clarifying. Uh, back into the personality theory work, back through, was it, I can't even remember the names of all these people, but back a good, good 150, something 200 years mm -hmm. to try and make sense of the ways in which people were identifying different kinds of approaches and different distinct personalities. Mm -hmm. And while I was happy to discount the Myers-Briggs stuff because that was very, very much not supported by scientific uh, research that followed it, the underlying original work of Jung in terms of extrovert and introvert was interesting. The mm -hmm. work that Asenk was doing, which developed that into four types, was interesting and seemed to align with some of what I was looking at. And then I also aligned some of that with sports psychology and aligned some of it with um, uh, also with some work in clinical psychophysiology, otherwise known as hypnosis mm -hmm. um, and biofeedback. And, and I kind of mixed it all together with the work I'd previously do, doing in academia. And I ended up with a model of this distinctive brain with certain core features. Uh, and, and for me, that's been the core of the work that I've been doing since. Um, and just to mention three of them. Uh, so I've, I've identified that, 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 that these brains seem to have a deep, deep autonomy drive, uh, not in a Freudian sense, just as this deep craving for autonomy mm -hmm. built into them almost 100% of the time. Uh, wow. And that this is effectively where all of our energies are going all of the time. Is so making what does that mean, an autonomy drive? What does that look like? It means that 100% of the time, our brains are trying to make sense of the world experientially on our own terms. Okay. Um, and that we are effectively experiential learning machines. Um, and that any time we have to make sense of the world on other people's terms, mm -hmm. in other, from other times and other places sometimes, that raises our stress levels because that becomes difficult for us. Um, and the, it, it's, on the one hand, it has that, you know, we, we dash for the improbable, effectively. Um, so what we have is this inbuilt tendency to head for the improbable, to head for the cracks where the light gets in. To, I kind of think of it in terms of the princess and the pea, mm -hmm. that we have this deep, deep instinct for understanding where something doesn't feel right. Um, I also call it homeostatic intelligence, but, but it's this sense of when, a, when a, a system is out of balance or when something's slightly out of, out of balance or out of whack. Mm -hmm. And we just have this deep, deep sense of that. And that's what we head for. So we head for where the greatest amount of experiential learning is likely to happen, um, which makes it very difficult for us when the world around us has been designed already with all the policies, protocols, procedures, everything in place, all the traditions in place, everything all laid out. There is very little experiential learning available in places where you're expected to have low autonomy, expected mm -hmm. to have low experiential participation and you're just expected to follow the rules or follow the follow what people tell you to do or follow the instructions or all that stuff and that that's really at the core of a lot of the difficulties we have which we maybe talk about later but but for the moment just that sense of this autonomy drive drives everything mm -hmm. um, and it is really the core thing the second thing which is related to that and this comes to the impulsivity and the hyperactivity and and um, and also inversely to the inattention. The second thing is that we have this deep, deep relationship with proximity, as I call it. So present time and present space. So our native space is effectively the 10 feet around us and the bodies we live in. Right? Yeah. I mean, yeah, of course, everybody's is. But because of our deep, deep 100% autonomous learning energies, mm -hmm. that is effectively our safe space. Okay. okay. As soon as we go beyond that 10 feet, uh, in terms of our attention, then mm -hmm. it becomes less safe and it becomes more stressful. Okay. That sounds hard. That is hard because the entire education system mm. is based on drawing our attention to things beyond that 10 feet. Mm. We are taught to learn what other people have thought. We are taught to learn what other people have done in other places. We are taught to, to, to regurgitate and imitate what other people have done in other times and other places. 
So we are effectively disengaged from our experiential learning systematically through conditioning, through an educational process, unless we're very lucky and have good teachers occasionally and uh, have, have follow things like you know, art practice or, or, mm. or like a Montessori or Steiner approach, maybe yeah. some, some Montessori teachers, some Steiner approaches. Yeah. Um, again, I, I, things in general, I have a difficulty kind of championing because particular things in particular places can be very, very of course. dubious. And uh, yeah, there are certain things about Steiner that in the present time might not be that palatable either. Mm -hmm. um, so There's going to be no one left soon, is there? <laughs> <laughs> um, but but that's but that's actually really important for for the ADHD brain because so-called because what happens is the, the vast majority of the people that I come into contact with and, and certainly in my own experience as well what happens is that the constant adaptation to the to the beyond your 10 feet the constant adaptation to the rest of the world leaves you just disconnected from your sense of yourself and your sense of how you make a difference and 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 for some people can lead to deep depression and for some people can lead to deep anxiety, depending on, on where they are in terms of their, their physiological kind of makeup. But it, it's, it's something which is, is the heart of the disabling process, um, is that disconnection from that 10 feet around you. Mm -hmm. and, and that for me is really important. So you've got your autonomy and you've got your proximity. And then there's another thing which people with these brains we tend to have and again this is has only been really identified in giftedness research and in very marginal and um, not terribly rigorous research on indigo children from the 1990s um, is the helpfulness instinct okay and, and this this deep deep helpfulness instinct that we have and it's connected to the proximity and it's connected to the autonomy but it's about you know we we just we want to be helpful. So one hundred percent of the time, almost, or maybe ninety nine percent, perhaps, but most of the time, we are intending to be helpful. Okay. Now, that flies in the face of everything that comes to mind with a stereotypical ADHD. You know, yeah. Tell me more. So we intend to be helpful, and the thing is that the more unsafe the environment we're in, mm -hmm. the more that helpfulness instinct simply becomes about self survival. Okay. okay. Um, or it can also become about self-denial and total commitment to an external uh, authority. Okay. Because you want to be helpful there too. So you can, you can channel it in different ways. But the, the, the thing is that the healthier the environment, the more that hyper-responsiveness to the immediate time and the immediate space from the proximity kind of stuff, the more that hyper responsiveness is deeply helpful because you can notice what can be helped, what can be improved. You're seeing the cracks where the light gets in. You're, yeah. you're, you're, you're respected enough for people to ex be aware of what you're able to do. And so if you're in a healthy team, that's wonderful. Yeah. You're, you're the person who sees the things that maybe somebody else didn't see. Yeah, yeah. You know, um, and you're like, have you thought about this? And you become a little bit of the helpful naysayer in some ways, mm -hmm. you mm -hmm. know, but, you know, in, in some teams, people don't respect that. And, and the more intense the environment becomes, the greater the likelihood is that that will not necessarily be respected, but the helpfulness instinct will keep ticking away, yeah. you know? And it's, it's something that I've had one client just started crying when I mentioned it, you know, because they, they, they've, they've spent their entire life with this helpful intention and no one had ever noticed it. Oh, because it was kind of clouded out by the way in which their behavior came across or? Yeah, and just, uh, just they did they'd fought to be part of a world that, that they couldn't feel part of. So what do you do then? I mean, what, what, you, how do you help? Well, it comes back to a strength-based approach. So you've got the, 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 the I think there's, there's, there's kind of five core, core traits as well. So another one would be very briefly would be um, this, this deep concern for safety. So emotional safety mm -hmm. is one of our abiding concerns that, that, um, in any environment which isn't obviously safe, emotional safety will trump any of any, will be a, the, the main guide in any decision making, mm -hmm. um, un unless we are aware of it and unless we're being strategic. Okay. Um, and that's, that's, that's the important part. So I, I teach people how to be strategic in, in, in where they feel less safe, which goes back to um, kind of what we talked about on Twitter. And then the, the, the final one would be uh, the question of, of, of authenticity. So, the way I frame it for, for clients is that with this brain, 
um, we can smell inauthenticity within ourselves or within others the way a dog smells fear. Wow. Okay. Right. So tell me more about that. I'm, I'm so if, if if we ourselves are not acting true to ourselves and what we yeah. feel are our core strengths, we will feel it. We will feel unhappy with ourselves and we will feel unhappy with the situation. And if we continue it, we could even get into self-loathing pretty easily as well. But but that sense of inauthenticity is we have very, very low tolerance for inauthenticity. Um, unless, again... In self or in others or in everyone? Either, but unless it's something we train ourselves to do, okay. it's one of the things that causes difficulties. One of the things that causes people to walk out of jobs without you know, a moment's notice. It's one of the things that, that says, look, I'm, I'm not doing this anymore. This doesn't feel right. Yeah. Um, and, and it's just this deep, deep feeling of this, this isn't right. This doesn't, you know, this just doesn't feel right. Um, and, and Those are the people that make change happen, no? Um, well, this is the thing. Uh, this is absolutely the thing. The, the earlier part of my work was, again, my, my, my academic work was very much about dynamics of violence and accelerative violence. Okay. Um, and about helpfulness so I, i've been developing what effectively is a, a discipline of helpfulness studies okay. um so one of the things i'm fascinated by and pretty much anybody with this brain tends to be fascinated by is you know what counts as appropriate what counts as helpful mm -hmm. when is what's appropriate unhelpful when is what's helpful inappropriate wow um you see and that that, that whole seri series of tensions then is kind of at the heart of, of how these brains operate because we, 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 we love knowing how stuff works. Mm -hmm. So if people are largely cognitively centered where they're largely in their heads and interiorize stuff, then those people tend to be about how ideas work and how they link to each other and how they all connect and how the systems work. If mm -hmm. they're more kind of body centered, then they tend to be more about operations in the world and how all that stuff works and how it can work more helpfully and all that sort of stuff. So yes, these are the, these are the, the alchemists, the wayfinders, the healers, the, you know, and, and I, I like to joke, but I'm not joking that, you know, I think these were the one person in the corner of the village who was either the healer or the, the lawgiver or the warrior poet or whatever in the village of 25 that had a more contemplative approach to what they were doing. Um, and was thinking more in terms of being helpfully thoughtful and thoughtfully helpful. There's a lot there. I think I, I want to interview you about eight more times on each of those topics. <laughs> I, I'm interested to know about your experience. So obviously your experience of ADHD has driven you to understand more about it. And that now you've explained your, your thoughts on it. I see so much of your work reflected in those traits that all kind of sits and makes a lot of sense but when like when did you learn that you um that you how do you even say were adhd have adhd how do you uh, i'm not good at words well well i i don't i i, I you know i have this phrase that the more the words matter the less the words matter which is the idea <laughs> but when, when we start quibbling over words then it's more to do with the the quality of the atmosphere is the issue not the words themselves um yeah i i'm i'm, I'm a poet i play with words i'm happy to play with words now um, so I, I talk about, I say, in terms of having an ADHD style brain, so, okay. you know, yeah. um, or an ADHD style personality, mm -hmm. um, because, but I also talk about it in terms of creative rebels, um, as I well. Like so, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm playing around with the idea of creative rebellion at the moment. So there's this idea of creative rebels, of, because effectively people who are creative rebels who haven't had the difficulties yeah. to that profound degree don't require a diagnosis. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You know, they, might, they might be helped with a little bit of guidance now and then, but they don't need a diagnosis and they certainly don't need the medication. You know, but if, if you are at the point where your life is falling apart, it's a bit like the idea of you know, um, people who say that addiction isn't addiction unless it's something that deeply, deeply affects your quality of life in a negative way. Mm -hmm. um, and it's the same with ADHD, that you have the brain you have, maybe start calling it ADHD when the way in which you interact with the world causes you difficulty to the extent that it hugely and negatively affects your quality of life yeah. and the quality of life of those around you. And that's what happened with me. So for 20 years or so, maybe longer, 30 years, I was joking. Well, maybe 30 years ago, they didn't talk about it. Mm -hmm. um, I was joking about having ADHD. Oh, I'm sure I just have ADHD, you know, blah, blah, blah. 
until such a point as I would walk from one room to the next and couldn't remember what I was there for. Um, until such time as, you know, I hadn't seen the floor for 30 years um, and I couldn't do the dishes and I couldn't put things in the laundry and I couldn't, which is difficult when you have a wife who's disabled who can fall over boxes in the hall. Wow, yeah. Um, and kids whose rooms aren't going to tidy themselves, um, and so on and so forth. So one of the things that was really important for me was, and I've, I've written about this in a poem called um, First, I think, yeah, First, which is online in various places. I think it's on my Twitter media feed. But, um, but that was effectively about that moment of acceptance that my wife turns to me and says, I think you need help. Um, and then I absolutely without hesitation said, yes, let's get help. Wow. You were ready uh, to hear that. Absolutely ready. I, what happened was I, I, there was a restructuring at the University of Ulster um, in the days, I think it was one of the first people of that trickle that it was eventually, uh, that eventually took the University of Ulster to, um, to court over it, but I was in the trickle at the beginning. Um, so I, I took voluntary redundancy while in quietly and secretly offered something else, which I won't say because it'll probably cause a, 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 a <laughs> kerfuffle and uh, <laughs> insert kerfuffle here that would have happened if I had said it out loud. Um, but <laughs> anyway, I uh, got out of the university career and I had been using my wife very much as a PA in many ways. And when my wife got um, pregnant for the first two children, which lasted about three years, really, in terms of the effects for her. Um, she was just too ill. She was largely bedridden almost for kind of nearly a full two years. Wow. Um, and as a result, she wasn't able to help me. And because that was suddenly taken away, I hadn't realized how much support and structure and scaffolding my wife had given me, Emma had given me, for everything that I was doing. Yeah. And my career just didn't happen. I had, I had a million different projects that didn't come off. At one point I walked in the door and said, uh, by the way, we're moving to Tasmania. Um, and, Sorry, uh, I shouldn't laugh. Her, I'm sure it wasn't funny at the time, but... It, it, it wasn't to her. It was entirely in um, earnest on my part. Uh, and, and so that, that was very much... We were lurching from one project to another. Um, I was trying to reinvent myself a million different ways and you know, constantly finding projects that would take over the world. And, you know, um, I started, uh, I got into a kind of depressive cycle and I started taking citalopram. Mm -hmm. And I've done that for a year and then I just got worse and worse and worse. And now I know, well, I'll explain that in a second. Um, I took, so I, I went to the, got the ADHD diagnosis mm -hmm. and, uh, that was a gateway then to getting stimulants, which overnight changed my life. Really? Overnight. Um, I went from not having any connection to the world to being able to do the dishes and do the laundry, everything within the first 24 hours, not a problem. I sat down at the table for dinner for the first time in, in, in five years. Because you took stimulants? Because I took stimulants. Why? Now, Why does it, what, 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 tell me more about that. Okay, so... This is got a deeper work that I'm working on at the moment, but what I'm interested in is why stimulants work for some people and not for other people. Okay. Now, um, I'm fascinated that a lot of the, the work that people uh, talk about in terms of stimulants often goes back to a study around 2006, which was done with rats who hadn't been diagnosed with or without ADHD. They were just rats. So, Sounds like a high quality study so far. I mean, go on. <laughs> it was a very high quality study. Um, but so the, a lot of focus for stimulants has been on dopamine and serotonin and the effect that, that that has on people. I'm not really interested in that because what I'm interested in is uh, clinical somatics. I'm interested in, in the degree to which people do or do not have um, a connection with their somatic sensory range. Yeah. Um, and what's very interesting to me is that people with kind of a low somatic profile who um, tend to have a more dissociative uh, kind of and dissociative depression uh, rather than anxious depression uh, approach to life that they tend to respond very well to, to stimulant. Um, whereas people with a, a deeper and a higher kind of somatic connection, they tend to be made anxious by, by stimulants. Yeah. 
So people who kind of just trying to put it in layman's terms, because I'm very fascinated by what you're saying, but you're very clever and use a lot of big words. So yeah. people who feel more are more likely to be made kind of anxious by. Uh, uh, it's not so much feel more because people who are kind of stuck in their heads a lot. So effectively mm -hmm. people who are stuck in their heads a lot. Mm -hmm. um, people who are stuck in their heads a lot uh, tend to have a better response to stimulants. Okay. Um, now my guess is, and this goes into stuff that maybe is a whole other conversation, but my guess is it's because the stimulants are sort of a surrogate, a surrogate sensory stimulation. They basically replace a real somatic stimulation with a pretend stimulation where the brain is basically saying, look, I'm not getting enough connection, a meaningful connection with the world. I'll take anything I can get. Yeah. And this is the closest clean, clear thing for the brain to anything I can get. Um, so there's a kind of a sleight of brain that takes place where the brain just goes, look, I'm not getting enough from the world, I'll take anything. Um, and a, a lot of the kind of buzz stimulation that people go for is again, the brain doing that. It's like, look, give me anything. I'll take anything at this stage because I'm not getting that connection, so I'll take anything. So the stimulants work for people who are very much down that road, yeah. um, who are very disconnected from the world. Um, and what fascinates me is that stimulants can backfire for people who either never had that profile mm -hmm. or down the road can backfire for people who have had both the deep body connection to themselves and then also develop the kind of the dissociative depression thing oh, and flip back and forth between them. I call it the washing machine. Oh. They flip back and forth between depression and, oh. and um, high confidence and depression, high confidence, depression, high confidence, depression, high confidence. Oh. So that would present almost like bipolar kind of. You can, yes, that's exactly how it presents. Um, and, and kind of, so you get that kind of hypomania and the depression. And it was, so, so what I discovered was that when I was taking citalopram and then taking Concerta, yeah. I increased the citalopram because things weren't quite right. Yeah. And it made me hypomanic for three days. Oh, wow, okay. Um, which then told me that the reason I got the diagnosis in the first place is because I'd been taking citalopram for mm. a year and it made me increasingly, increasingly distractible and wow. disconnected. Wow, that's, that's quite, wow, there's a lot there. Okay, so, gosh. So, one thing then, you'd been studying ADHD for already quite a long time and you had quite a deep understanding of it for quite a long time before it occurred to you or your wife. No, not at all. Not at all. Um, my study was in the social sciences. I see. Okay. So, okay. But um, that's in I, I had a deep, I had a deep interest in psychiatry and I had a deep interest in psychology and I knew kind of I had a background in, in understanding kind of psychology back to, to William James and okay. Freud and all that sort of stuff. Um, but in terms of mental illness, my main experience had been through depression as I understood it. Okay. Um, and looking back, I'd, I'd made attempts as, people tend to with this brain. I'd made attempts to diagnose myself with, with uh, ME and CFS and chronic fatigue syndrome and uh, various other things because that deep exhaustion yeah. is very characteristic um, of, of this brain. So, because you're, it's, it's, I've, I've worked as a translator and interpreter and I know that when you, when you work in another language all the time, yeah. it exhausts you. Yeah. And that's why in, in Europe, when people do interpreting, they do 20 minutes on, 20 minutes off, 20 minutes on, 20 minutes off, because your brain cannot cope with that intensity. And that's one of the things that exhausts us. Wait, you, sorry, you've worked as an interpreter as well. Just, you just threw a, that in. A, a, little, a little bit. No, my, my first degree was languages. I worked as a kind of, I've done interpreting a lot, kind of informally along the way, but I have worked as a translator. Um, uh, Cause languages was my first degree. So I started off in languages and then I went to history, literature, folklore stuff. And then I went to anthropology of music. Um, and critical legal studies and various other things. Um, but all of those things, effectively what I did looking back was I took a journey from high top of my head, disconnection with the body, sight, sound, and journeyed back through the body in all the disciplines I took. So my disciplines are actually, can be staged back down through, if you want to talk about chakras, if you're that way inclined, you can. Um, but the, the disciplines are, are staged a kind of staged return to my body in retrospect. Okay, so you now are feeling that you're kind of connected. <laughs> no, it's still a journey. <laughs> how many, Sometimes. how many more careers are we going to have? <laughs> Sometimes, I think. I think. Okay. One of, one of my difficulties is that the for me one of the reasons for me that um, so I've, I've been I've been building polyvagal theory into a lot of this. 
So one of the things that fascinates me is the way in which, um, so I've, I've built polyvagal theory into work I was doing on how different levels of intensity mm -hmm. leads to different qualities of response and different qualities of expectation. You, know, you have to explain happen. polyvagal I'll theory. Explain, I'll explain what I mean by that. So as you raise the intensity of a, of a, of a, within a person, for example, mm -hmm. the type of thinking that tends to happen will change in quality, right? Um, so yeah. turn it around. As you de-escalate the intensity, as you lower the intensity within the disposition, within a person, within a kind of psychological profile within yourself, Mm -hmm. helpful thinking simply starts to happen yeah you know this yourself from from the work you do with people i just don't so, use posh words <laughs> yeah exactly yeah, yeah. so so, so basically when your brain's doing that you can't think that's yeah, exactly yeah so um and it's uh, i think i once saw the um was it uh, russell brand was talking about in the oxford union about how you know people people where am i camera mm -hmm. people doing that there to other people you know well if the other person does that there to them there's just lots of that going on you know, um, hand flapping just for anyone listening on the podcast here. <laughs> oh, sorry. Yes. If, 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 kind of um, yeah. talking hands. So what's important is that the people who the, the people who have a kind of a low somatic, low body connection response to the world. Yeah. They tend to default to the what the polyvagal people would call the dorsal zone. So they tend to default in stress responses to the fight, sorry, to the freeze and overreact response. Okay. Okay. So they tend to go to, you know, the place where the blood drains the essential organ, or, organs um, and you, you basically do whatever it takes to survive. And it's very much a place of existential threat. So, so that's the, the stress response default. And that was one of the key things for me at an early stage of realizing that for these people with these particular kinds of brains, that was a particular default response only for some of them. Yeah. Right. The okay. second... Yeah, so the second personality type I realized was where people with this type of brain have a default to the sympathetic system, which is the fight, flight, and control mm -hmm. response to stress. So that's very, that's not driven. So the, the top one tends to be driven, it would seem, by kind of oxytocin and intensity. Mm -hmm. but the second one tends to be driven by adrenaline and cortisol um, and is very much about uh, fight, flight, or control, it tends to be very much the, the, the I'm, I'm big place, um, whereas the dorsal zone tends to be the I'm very small place. Okay. Um, right. But then the big insight for me was realizing there weren't just two types, because I assumed I was the, the dorsal type. I assumed I was the kind of the, the low connection to the, the world place, because I, I, what got me to this work, uh, that particular quality of work, was that I had always found it very difficult to understand what was going on in my body. So this yeah. question of interoception. So what was going on in my body was always kind of a bit of a mystery to me. So to the extent that needing to go to the toilet, needing to eat, needing to drink, feeling tired, all of those were felt as sort of a sensory muddle. So you, you couldn't um, pick up on your internal cues kind yeah. of. Hadn't, yeah. hadn't a chance. Um, so, you know, I'd be surprised by the fact that I, I was nearly doubled over when needing to go to the loo um you know in some cases and, and had that and, always been the case for you or when I, when i was very young it was certainly the case and i eventually traced it back and, and and this is one of the things that got me was i traced it back to biomedical trauma when i was about um two wow so i had three days of intense uh, peritonitis and burst appendix when i was two and i was on a boat a greek ship mm -hmm. uh in the ocean at the time and they diagnosed me with flu and my parents were having to deal with this um, but my appendix burst and I was had it for about three days, worst possible scenario, I should have died a million times. Mm. And that seemed to leave me with this deep quality of default to existential threat and this deep pathological shyness that I had throughout my life. Um, but one thing I could never understand and never included in that conversation was something that I, that I realized when working with a different, with another client was that I also always had the desire to be on stage and to be seen and always had this deep confidence that I could do something, always had this deep, deep sense of purpose that I, that, I, that I had really important things to do. So I had the big, big sense of self thing going on too. Yeah. And suddenly realized I was both. So there weren't just two wow. types. There were actually, there was also a combination type to get all ADHD about it. Um, but the combination <laughs> type wasn't the combination of the symptoms. It was the combination of people who do the washing machine between the dorsal 
um, stress response and the sympathetic stress response. And you get mm -hmm. that kind of flip flop, flip flop. And the higher the stress, the quicker the flip flop. Okay. Um, so and that, you, that yeah. must be hard to manage though, right? Because how you would manage one is quite different. A bit like you found with the yeah. drugs, no? You kind of- Entirely, entirely. And, it, and it's, it's very confusing too, because it leaves you with a sense of almost dual personality, mm. you know, because you become this inner contradiction because you, you, you want to sidle over or swaggery to the girl over there in the corner, if that's the way you're inclined, um, you know, at the disco when you're, you're 16. But then I spend my time half an hour counting down the 10 second um, ultimatums until I go over and never go over. Yeah. You know, so it's complete hell. Yeah. Um, you know, you have this a deep inner confidence that you know, you know, you can do stuff, but then you can never do stuff. Um, and you get stuck in that. So working with that is a very, very, very different kettle of fish. Um, and what's fascinating about it is that the, the dorsal response is driven by story. Mm -hmm. And the sympathetic response is driven by, by external sensory body response. Um, so the stories are what flood in. Mm. and bring people back to the dorsal and then the intuition kicks in and brings people back to the sympathetic but then the stories flood in and bring them back to the dorsal and so blah, 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 blah. you know so yes at, at, at high 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 stress levels that can look like bipolar mm. so how do you how do you help i mean this is what you do now you you yeah, help yeah, what do. so very quickly I've, i have a kind of a questionnaire that i give people from the research i've been doing to kind of work out where on that they, they sit themselves in terms mm -hmm. of what their general stress responses tend to be, what their inclinations tend to be. Yeah. If somebody is kind of born low somatic, as you can be, if you're mm -hmm. born low somatic, very rare, but people can be born with a very, very deep, technically they call it alexisomia, mm -hmm. a kind of deep disconnection to their, their, their bodies. Yeah. Um, then it's a very slow and patient process of slowly and gently building that relationship up, relationship up with the world um, yeah. of kind of very simple somatic exercises, very simple connections with the body, very simple sensory stuff. Um, there, there's, there's lots of different areas you can look to, things like um, somatosensory psychotherapy, um, um, uh, some kinetic work, some, you know, but also very simple things like, you know, learning how to boil an egg in some cases. Um, you know, because you often have this such a deep connect, disconnection to the world that you literally cannot do anything for yourself. Mm -hmm. And if that then com gets compounded by having traumatic experiences on top of that, yeah. eek, right? So, it, it, so in some cases, people, you know, do have to uh, kind of go off and do trauma work with other people as well. Mm -hmm. But for the stuff that is kind of basically non-trauma related, mm -hmm. some of the trauma response exercises that people do can also be very helpful so a lot Why? of the stuff that people because it's about reconnecting with with reality with the world with what's there okay. so it's about re reassociation re so reassociation yeah with the people who are kind of more sympathetic and like myself who have had and still have sometimes anger issues and things like that and you know it's, it's a very different thing because what happens is because people with the this, this kind of high body connection they're like this raging river of energy mm. so where people who are kind of born with kind of a cognitive head inclination uh might spend some time in their heads people who have the raging river of energy who then go into their heads then spend about 85 percent of the time compulsively overthinking yeah. um and it's this huge river of that going on up there so that can be difficult so again that's about reconnecting them with their core sense of confidence that has never gone away. Um, and what's helpful with, with these clients is they tend to recover very quickly because once they realize that their core sense of self is coming from the confident place, yeah. they learn to notice when the stories come rushing in. Okay. Um, they learn to trust their connection with the world. They learn to you know, trust that exercise and movement and being out in the world and doing stuff out in the world will flow and reconnect with everything. Um, and they, they just learn to be aware of their triggers for getting back up there in their head again, yeah. you know, and stuff like that. So there's, there's a number of different things you can do with people, but I find actor training is very helpful. Okay. Certain kinds of actor training. Why? Because that's, that's about people. Um, it's been designed for people who are drawn to the stage, first of all. So they're drawn, these are people who are, have that big sense of self, but frequently have these head issues as well. So it's been designed for people to bring them back into their bodies to bring them back into certain types of actor training, bring them back into that sense of being comfortable with their movement, being comfortable with themselves, 
and being aware of that 10 feet around them in terms of qualities of atmosphere, qualities of relationship. So actor training can be very deeply powerful for, for certain people with this brain. Really, really fantastic. That makes sense now you've explained it, but when you first said it, I thought it would almost be the opposite because you're sort of, what you're saying, it's almost like you're looking to be more authentically connected to self. And then you're saying, so you do actor training, which to me suggests the opposite, but that, yeah, you've explained that. So, yeah. so we kind of, the reason we initially were going to talk was this whole idea about kind of, yeah, being authentic about your lived experience and whether that's a good thing or whether it can ever be traumatic and having understood your kind of, um, yeah, take on, on ADHD and thinking about, on th I'm, just tell me more because you've done thinking on this already. In, you yeah, know, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So, so one of the one of the biggest difficulties um, with this brain is that that people, as I said before, adapt one hundred percent of the time to the world that isn't designed for them. Yeah. Now, what happens then is they kind of might not have developed any clear sense of self at all. They might have not not have any clear sense of kind of kind of almost dismissed any question of self esteem because there's nothing there. If, if you're constantly throwing yourself at the wall hoping it'll stick, you know, constantly bringing the circus to town hoping people will like the circus. You know, and, and, and not shout something wicked this way comes. Um, that, that, that's kind of what you've spent your energy doing. Um, and you keep thinking it'll work next time. It'll work next time. And, and you know, um, insert Einstein quote about, you know, probably mis misattributed about, you know, keep doing the, the, the same thing that hasn't worked last time and, and hope it'll work the next time and something to do with insanity and all that sort of thing. So, that, that's what people tend to do. So what, what tends to happen is they don't then develop that authentic sense of self yeah. while also having this deep radar for authenticity and inauthenticity. So it becomes deeply, deeply distressing, um, that sense of disconnect. So what I do is I, I, I encourage people to dial down the amount to which they throw themselves at the world. Okay. Okay. So I basically get them to dial down the emotional intensity when they throw themselves at the world. So you don't plant trees with flourish where they're gonna get cut down, okay? Um, and in fact, you might just go and have a chat about chainsaws with the people who are cutting down trees and, and not, try and cut down, not try and plant trees there at all. Um, so the idea is that you spend, it's kind of the 80-20 principle reversed. It's the 20-80 principle. The idea is instead of inv investing 100% of your energy throwing yourself at the world, at most invest 20% of your energy throwing yourself at the world mm -hmm. and at least 80% of your energy working on your strengths, working on what nourishes you, working on what you flourish with um, and, and building that world of safety and, 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 and autonomy and proximity and helpfulness and, 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 and uh, authenticity within yourself and within your space, within your, your relationships. And, and, and that's the key about the, the inauthenticity is that when you are deliberately performing inauthenticity mm -hmm. in, in a world which was not designed for you and which does not operate on your basis, and this is hugely relevant to conversations about uh, passing in uh, racial terms as well and passing in autism and passing in lots of other areas, um, that you do learn to adapt. Now, there's a very thin line between adaptation and assimilation because one key thing remember about this brain is that it is resistant to paths that are previously well trodden i was wondering about that right uh, how does that work so what i call it i call it the performance of the probable so okay. effectively what you do is you learn to perform the probable of what people expect yeah by doing that, if it's a fairly healthy and safe environment to begin with, by doing that, you can then build trust mm -hmm. that you're not going to do something off the wall okay. and, 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 and shock people. And that when you've performed the probable and shown that you're credible in, 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 in a PhD, for example, it would be the literature review yeah. is the performance of the probable. Um, when you've done that, the more you do that, the more room you build for your autonomy. Okay. Okay. okay, the more room you build for yourself, because the greater the trust and safety that other people feel around you, yeah. the greater or well, the lower the intensity will be, and the more room there will be for everybody to be experiencing it in a more helpful way. But the deliberate performance of inauthenticity mm -hmm. doesn't take anywhere near as much energy as throwing yourself authentically into an inauthentic space where you cannot 
be yourself without causing friction and ripples and trouble and everything else. Yeah. Now, sometimes people will want to make friction and cause trouble and everything else if there are questions of legality, safeguarding, um, uh, oppression, uh, violence, structural violence, you name it. Okay, so what we're talking about is the performance of inauthenticity in environments which are effectively those of professional practice. Okay, so you, you kind of pick your battles. You pick your battles. Um, and the idea is that you, you perform the probable, you only make a fuss mm -hmm. if you're willing to live with the consequences or walk. Mm -hmm. And you only make a fuss in, cons in, in situations of legality, yeah. um, safeguarding, health and safety, or basic human dignity. And is that, is that how you live? Um, it wasn't how I lived and I suffered badly for it. Um, so I suffered at least kind of four years of bullying at different jobs and universities. Mm -hmm. um, and they nearly broke me. They nearly broke me. So one of the things that this is, is about knowing how people with these brains can be both prone to being bullied and scapegoated. Yeah. Because they're the ones that tend to say, but hold on a second, but hold on a second. Um, and if they have um, some of the, 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 if they have a history of trauma, then that, that also, you know, people with a history of trauma can, can be seen a mile away by people who have a radar for these things uh, and like bullying. Um, so the other thing is that sometimes people with this brain can also be the bullies, um, uh, which is an interesting kind of flip as well. Mm -hmm. um, but bullying is something that, that often happens in and around people with these brains, whether they're the ones who, who suffer from it or the ones who inflict it. So one of the thing I, thing I learned from that, and, and one thing I went on to do, was to look at um, systems change. And, and I became a specialist in cultural climate in organizational systems, um, and looking at how to either transition to or, or move to uh, a cultural climate within an organization that allows for greater helpfulness and safety for everyone involved, um, where it isn't just a rhetoric of inclusion and safety, where it is actually um, a quality of relationship is fostered and, 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 and facilitated in and through the ways in which they do things. But the difficulty in that and the difficulty and the reason I, I train people in this is because the work, the, the, the orthodox best practice and standard practice of every professional practice I have looked at institutionally, mm -hmm is ultimately leading to a space which leads to less helpful relationship. How, that's a, why? That's a, that's a big statement. Yeah. It's, it has to do with three things in particular, but one is the, the, the level of intensity that people are encouraged through issues of urgency and productivity and you know go, 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 and grow, 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 and all this sort of stuff. Uh, so the, 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 the levels of intensity are exponentially already and ever being pushed. Um, secondly, there's a, a level of kind of low relational density, if you want to think of it in one way, or, or elimination of uncertainty thinking mm -hmm. in another way, that is at the heart of the orthodoxies of most professional practice. Um, and that's in terms of efficiency, in terms of administration, in terms of bureaucracy. Yeah. And another thing that becomes very, very important in these environments is very highly directive forms of power. So should, must, need to, have to, ought yeah. to, um, you know, so you're talking about, um, uh, essential essential job requirements and job description all this sort of stuff it's all about should must need to have to it's all about very strong push very strong pull they're not gentle environments mm -hmm. um, and those tend to be environments that tend to be associated with the freeze and overreact response in the people i work with I um and and that's that's why it becomes very very difficult to go in there just as yourself without a sense of armor without a sense of some sort of sense of performing a role, which is very clear and where the expectations are very clear. Yeah. Um, because also there's so much to critique in those types of environments yeah. that our, there's something not quite right here, just goes and, and just goes crazy. So you kind of, you either need to change the environment or the person needs to kind of, yeah, ad adapt and, and be inauthentic, I guess, in your words, or do you both? Yeah. So, so if you perform the probable at the levels where you need to be inauthentic and just totally, just be a cog, embrace the cog in a sense, yeah. um, then you might, if you still, if you want to be in that industry, then you can actually 
perform the probable to the extent that you get promoted and then you perform it a little bit less. You get promoted, you perform a little bit less. If you're at a level of, of executive leadership or a level of any level of leadership, then you can be a little bit more um, innovative and responsive in the work that you do and be rewarded for it. Yeah. But if you try and be that responsive at a low level, yeah. you'll be crushed. You'll be crushed. Yeah. You know, and, and it just get you into trouble. And you know, people don't want to know what your opinion is. They just don't um, at the low levels. Uh, so unless it's in your job description, perform the probable uh, is basically the idea. That's a um, tough message, though. No, it's it is and it isn't in the sense that first of all, it's self care. Yeah, uh, that it's about self care and survival on the one hand. If it is in your job description, and if you like, for me, it is in my job description to help people change their environments. Then I go in and I perform the improbable. Yeah. But if it is your job description to just do what you do, you know, then find other areas of your life. Don't give it all your energies. Just, you know, if you want to be the person that changes the system, you're not going to do it by being in a role where changing the system is not what you do. Yeah, I see what you mean. Yeah. So, yeah. You know, so, you know, you don't, you don't, going to the point of highest intensity is the point where you are least able to make a difference. Yeah. Um, in any system. So that that's the that's the, the the counterintuitive thing that people think 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 seem to think that you know, rush to the point of highest intensity because that's where you know my my desire to resist and change the system will will, will be most effective. It's where it's going to be least effective because it's where what you most value in yourself is going to be least valued. I see, and you need to build up that trust, that rapport, that yeah, kind of credibility. So you're, am I right in understanding that you're you're kind of saying then that essentially in order to sort of live a fulfilling life if you have a ADHD type brain then that you are going to um, kind of practice some degree of inauthenticity in some circumstances but that you would choose the means of your kind of life where you would be wholly authentic. Yes and, and, and put the entire you know 80 percent at least of your efforts into being authentic and being grounded and being as much yourself as you can be um, and the more toxic the environment you're working in, the mm -hmm. less emotional energy you give it. Okay. So if you're in a hugely toxic emotional uh, working environment, yeah. then you give it 5% of your emotional energies. Um, so if someone's in an environment, I'm, you know, I get asked about this a lot, um, not, not about ADHD, but just generally about how like, open and honest we should be about our own struggles. And I think just more widely that, you know, if, <laughs> If you're me it doesn't really matter how open and honest i am because i don't account you know I, I, it's just up to me what i do and, and no one's paying my wages and you know it doesn't really matter if i if i rock the boat it's just my problem if i were uh, trying to hold down a, a role within a company then as you say it, it it can cause issues so people do sometimes say you know oh should i be more open more honest and 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 actually similar to what you're saying it's about i often say it's about picking those battles um, and that actually sometimes you're not going to be received in the way you want to. And that can be deeply difficult as well when you try to be yourself and it's, it's yeah, not, not well received. So if then we might accept that, yes, okay, so we might practice within our work, if perhaps we're not in a position to change the environment there, we, we practice the inauthenticity there, which bits of our life, like where can we be authentic? Where is it safe to be authentic? What's your experience there? Well, you know, I, 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 for me, it's, it's, it's in my house, it's in the home. Um, it's in the work that, you know, I do as a helpful professional. So, you know, yeah. I can be as authentic as I, as I can within the coaching um, space and, and kind of in, in the, as a coach presence in the room. Yeah. Um, and, and I have certain friends that from the get go, it's always been just, you know, non-judgmental space. Um, so there, there are certain, we, we, we've, I've also been very, very deliberate in gravitating towards those types of spaces in my life as well. Yeah. I've been very, I've been very deliberately, excuse me, aware, uh, in, in, in finding a, a, a lifelong partner as well, that, yeah. you know, I, I was trying to gradually gravitate towards a quality of relationship with myself that would be more in tune with somebody that I would like to be with. Um, and I think that we kind of learn it by default through knowing what isn't safe, through knowing what isn't authentic. Uh, and it becomes a reversal thing. But in terms of revealing ourselves, then in the spaces where we are performing a certain degree of inauthenticity, yeah. again, it's about reading the room, you know, um, that, and, and I, I do temp work sometimes to, to keep myself fresh. Yeah. And 
I was in a temp job where I revealed that I had ADHD mm -hmm. and you know, taught, had a discussion about reasonable adjustments and then they were all ignored. Um, and How did that uh, feel? it was absolutely awful, but the way I had to deal with it was dial myself down to almost zero and just get on and do exactly what I was required to do to embrace the cog. And then at a certain point, I just left. Um, what, what would be what what would those reasonable adjustments be just for anyone who might be you know might have a colleague who is yeah so so one, one simple thing was that um you know I, I asked i specifically asked not to let me near any spreadsheets okay um because spreadsheets in my brain just go ah! <laughs> right and then despite the fact that i had this conversation about please don't let me near any spreadsheets and possibly the only thing i really asked for um and stay away, keep me away from the finances. It was like, okay, today you're going to do the finance spreadsheet. And I'm like, <laughs> what, what, what? But at that point, it had got to the point where I, I knew there were other things going on that I realized I didn't want to work there, so I wasn't gonna make a fuss. Yeah. So that was the, if you're prepared to walk, don't make a fuss. Um, uh, they, so I just, I just walked out eventually, but, the, but there were certain things going on where, you know, so I, with, with ADHD brains, so-called, that you, you don't tend to have a very much of a working memory. So, mm -hmm. you know, I, I would tend to write things down um, if I needed to remember them. And I'd be told by the, the micromanaging line manager that um, I didn't need to do it that way. I had to do it the way they were telling me, you know, or being told that what I was doing on the screen, which was working out the software program by myself, which is something I'm pretty good at, uh, was not the right way to do it because I had to do it exactly the way, the way, the way that they did it. Um, and I've come across that before as well, where, where people, a couple of times where people are telling you how to do something on a computer their way mm. instead of just saying you know sorry no my brain works differently and i've actually said this explicitly something my brain actually works differently it's, it's much easier for me if i just work it out on my own yeah um and, and you specifically just, struggle to yeah you need that autonomy they ignore it they just ignore it and, and plow on and get angry with me you know um so that sort of thing is difficult it's, it's a difficult decision do you or do you not reveal that you have adhd and i think if you're in a definitely if you have a long-term relationship and safe and quali good quality of relationship with the people you work with and you think this will add to a greater support for you in the workplace, fantastic, go ahead. Yeah. But read the room. You know, yeah. if this is not somewhere where you feel um, uh, non-judgmentally that, yeah. that people are supporting you, if you feel there is constant judgment, if you feel there is constant micromanagement, it's unlikely that it's gonna be a safe space for revealing anything about yourself that isn't about the cog. Yeah. Um, so read the room. Uh, and sometimes people have to stay in work just to earn money. Yeah. Um, and, and so I'm very well aware of that, I've been there myself. We have to do a job that you hate just to earn money. If you do have to do that, that's where it becomes really important to just stay in your box, stay in your lane, do the job, come home, and then have a life that you love. You know, <laughs> because, you know sometimes you do have to do the shitty stuff, um, and it's just it's just what you have to do. Um, so you know, with families, we have to put food on the table. So that's uh, that, that's very much at the heart of it, and it's about again picking your battles that you know the more you develop your, your sense of strength for yourself the more you can then bring that to other places where you will be more effective where you will be more helpful and the more you can explore that that, that helpfulness instinct to actually you know join groups or join uh organizations or just start projects where that helpfulness can really take take flight we covered a lot. So I'm really aware of the time and the time has flown and I want to talk to you for about eight more hours. Um, I wonder if we can finish by thinking, I, I like to always keep things practical as well. Like lots of people yeah. who um, kind of engage with me, it's because they want advice. And I wondered if you might end with talking to us about you know how can we be a good friend to an adult with adhd or a good parent to a child with adhd or kind to ourselves if we think we may have an adhd style brain yeah one, one of the the key things is to remember that they primarily uh only really work in the present tense in the present space okay you know so um if you're there going but you said this and you said that and you said the other because they feel the social pressure of needing to, to of thinking you need a memory response. Mm -hmm. They're going to perhaps even invent a memory response. And it won't be what they actually remember necessarily. Uh, and it may not actually even be true, but because you're ex expecting a memory, they'll give you one. Um, so, you know, when we're younger, we sometimes become really good at lying because 
we keep we, people keep expecting us to know what happened in the past um, so <laughs> we give it to them so so that's the thing is just that they will work that we work best when we're in the, when we're here now you know okay. when, if you've got us in the room you've got us in the room so if kind of mindful interaction essentially being yeah quite. if you haven't if you haven't got us in the room you haven't really got us mm -hmm. uh, and if we don't respond to your emails or if we don't respond to to things you've asked us to do it's because we're not in the room <laughs> effectively um and and so so these things any, anything that isn't about us in the room can be difficult uh and isn't isn't first nature it's, it's second nature and um so that that's 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 very important uh, so then representing us back to ourselves can be very problematic you always do this you never do that mm -hmm. it's because if, if people start bringing evidence to us about what we've done in the past we largely don't remember can't remember and we generally responded to the moment in a way that we thought was best yeah you know we make mistakes you know and if we do make mistakes it's often hard for us to learn to say sorry but if we say sorry it needs to be in the moment yeah um and sometimes we don't understand why we need to say sorry because we thought we were trying to do something helpful yeah um so again not assuming that our tensions are bad okay um, okay okay it's very very important um and just just generally we can be very very loving and very very responsive mm -hmm. um but know that if our stress levels are very high um chances are we're going to be more responsive to what's in our heads and we're going to be acting more inappropriately in what's in terms of what's around us okay um and this is a, a huge issue but you know just mention it is that also, I find that parenting tends to be very difficult for people with these brains. As the parent or the child? For, for the parent. Okay. Um, because um, you have a safe, non-judgmental space mm -hmm. where you're allowing yourself to hyper-respond to this kid that you love. Yeah. But sometimes the parental role requires you to be in a box and be in a lane. And those two things, you know, go against each other. So you can spend your time... Wow. Um, trying to be the parent of establishing clear expectations but then when the intensity rises because you've established clear expectations and they resist them um, mm -hmm. especially if they have brains like you then that can just lead to this blah so sometimes being a parent can be very difficult with this brain because it, there's a there's a the, the expectations suddenly become unpredictable when there's another person like you in the room yeah um, so how do becomes, you how yeah. do you manage that what do you um, largely by delegating to the other person who's an adult, um, <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, or taking time outs or, or, uh, largely what works tends to be avoiding words. Avoiding words? Say more about that. Uh, so, <laughs> Ironic. <laughs> so, so moving in, in, instead of shouting at kids, move forward and give them a hug if they're a huggy kid or so I've one, I've one kid who's a huggy kid and I've one kid who's a, you know, not so much a huggy kid, but, um, a, 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 a brief hug kid. Um, so you know just ignore the words if you can manage it um but it but again the more stressed you are the harder it is to do um but but avoid words and, and move forward and sometimes one of the kids i seem to be able to diffuse them by just putting my hands out and for a daddy hug um instead of shouting at him um, yeah. but i'll probably shout at him at some point as well um we all have those uh those moments don't we my uh one of my daughters this morning I was having a tough morning. I couldn't even tell you why, but you know, we just all have those days, don't we? I was not uh, managing especially well and um, for whatever reason anyway, got quite snappy. And uh, my daughter followed me outside and I was like, what do you want? And she's like, I just thought you might want a hug, mummy. But I wasn't in that moment where I could accept <laughs> it. And so I went, well, not right now. And then, and then I came away from that and I felt horrible. And a few minutes later, I got this little knock on my door and it was her and I was like, I'm so, so sorry. And she came in and she went, I made you a cup of coffee because if a hug doesn't work, a coffee will. <laughs> I was like, wow, I have just been a horrible person. And here's this amazing little, yeah. Parenting's hard, just, isn't just, it? Just remember that the, the, of all those things I mentioned earlier, the bridge for people who are, whether it's the parent or a child or, or, or a relationship with a child, the bridge to making things better for somebody with ADHD is the safety bridge. Safety bridge, okay. Okay, so if you can in any way make it a safer space, yeah, they will respond helpfully to that. Yeah. Um, so they're, they're, that, that's where the, like, um, I'm not sh quite sure about the term of unconditional positive regard, because I think everything's conditional in the sense of it as conditions. But uh, if I weren't being so pedantic, unconditional positive <laughs> regard um, is, is very important. That sense of just 
you know, people with this brain tend to do their best they can under the circumstances, as do most people. Um, and so when we get scared and stressed and feel unsafe, we can really withdraw into ourselves, like hugely. Yeah. Like we, 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 can, we can build up huge castle walls in a second, um, particularly if we have histories of existential threat. Um, so, but it can happen like that and we can come out of it very quickly as well. Yeah. You know, but it's hyper response. It's always hyper response. So again, that's something to remember that, that even if we go into a flash response to something, give us, give us space, we'll come out of it again. Okay. We, we will respond to the quality of the relationship that we find around us. Yeah. Um, and that is what we will respond to. Uh, even if we've misrepresented it to ourselves, that is what we'll respond to. So if in doubt, try to create that kind of emotional safety and then the rest may follow. Wow. That's a lovely note to end on. Thank you. I, uh, it's been a fascinating and wow, a lot of different stuff. I'm going to need to go and lie in a darkened room and just kind of absorb all that you said, but I've, I've hugely enjoyed talking to you um, and would like to talk to you for days. And your brain is a very interesting place, isn't it? Like you, you think a million miles an hour. It's brilliant. I love it. Yeah, but and fascinating to me that that I now know why that is. Yeah. <laughs> um, but also, it's it's great that I live with someone who um, can very clearly and half jokingly say to me, "I understand all your theoretical work. I just don't really care." <laughs> and that is exactly the person that I need to be with. Um, you know, but, uh, <laughs> she made it very clear from the beginning she was no fangirl. Um, so you know that, but that's exactly and that that people like us uh, thrive. Like, like, like people that say kind of, kind of brain thrive on the ordinary, yeah. you know, thrive on that lack of, you know, push. Mm -hmm. um, and and that, that we, we can kind of build our own interest and, and motivation through what we do. But having someone around who kind of gravitates, brings me towards a more gentle place yeah. is what I kind of always looked for um, and was lucky to find. So, so that, that, that sense of having that understanding to just let us get on with it mm -hmm. um, is very how very did you meet uh on the now defunct guardian soulmates that's a whole other that's a whole other podcast <laughs> but uh she, she was in london i was in northern ireland and uh um yeah i just um i, I sent her and uh i'd said seen her a year before that but i hadn't connect contact with her contacted her and then i sent her an email and then we were engaged um within four months within well within five skype she was on my doorstep so um and uh we we got into the top 10 of guardian soulmate stories a few years ago um oh and, incredible uh, but uh yeah we, we we got married within um nine months and uh now have two kids and uh we're hitting was it i can never remember the year we got married but uh we're, we're going on uh, nine ten years now so wow um, that was yeah. incredible that's incredible. Oh, it's lovely. Well, well, congratulations on being in the top 10 Guardian Soulmates. I, I'm, I'm intrigued. I, if, if, does it exist out there? Can you send me a link? Can we? Um, I don't know if it's still out there, but uh, we, we, we were very close. I think we were beaten to the um, top spot by somebody who worked in an office block and got people to vote, um, is my guess. <laughs> um, but, that's, uh, that's not on, is but, it? Yeah. It's just not on. It was very unfair. So, <laughs> but, uh, yeah, we, we, we like that we have a, a whirlwind romance and um, we keep it. But it, our, our kids are so much part of our lives now that we keep uh, looking at wedding photographs and wondering where they were. Um, <laughs> yeah. So. And I bet they, they, my kids have no conception of the fact that there was a world before them. Uh, we, yeah. Uh, yeah, every now, I mean, they're my girls are 10 now and they still don't really seem to get that you know the world did exist more than 10 years ago they make me feel very old all the time and i think in the scheme of things i'm not that old but uh yeah they have a, a great way of making me feel old wow wow i hope we'll speak again yes indeed enjoy this thank you very much for the opportunity and invitation yeah no and thank you and i'll put links to you sent me a whole bunch of um interesting links to things that you do um including your kind of creative stuff as well which um is a whole nother avenue we didn't go so much into but i will um i'll put those those links all in the uh description on youtube or in the show notes uh on the podcast so people can link through to you um and i'll put your your twitter and stuff so people can chat to you because i'm sure that there'll be plenty of people who've got many questions for you i still have hundreds but i'm um, you know 
<laughs> well, one, one thing to say as well is that I, I, I very much speak horses to courses, uh, for, horses for courses that, uh, you know, I can also speak uh, ordinary speak as well um, as the theoretical stuff. So, um, you know, I, I generally only speak the theoretical stuff to people who kind of tend to be well able for it. Um, but uh, you I can think have a I'm clever. I'm kind of like, oh, quite... oh you've, you have color coded books. Come on. <laughs> Uh, Color coded yeah. books. I'm getting out a new psycho neuropsychology chat. Yeah, I get it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, so, uh, but yeah, it's. Um, but also, one of the things that, that's always been very important to me is even if I do the theoretical stuff, I try and rephrase it in ordinary ways yeah. as soon as I do it, because um, there are there are a million ways we can tell stories about what we do and how we think. But um, it's uh, and, and and my writing tries to go to a more personable place, um, yeah. which is less theoretical. But yeah. uh, that's a but I love that, yeah, you, you bring such kind of, yeah, so much kind of theory and depth of thought and intelligence to it. But really, everything you've said comes back to taking it from a very person-centered point of view, which is, I, I, in my humble opinion, exactly the way that these things should always be done. So, um, mm -hmm. yeah, I look forward to kind of, yeah, continuing to follow your, um, your, your thoughts, your theories, your ideas, and, and kind of keeping in touch. And, uh, yeah, next time you have... Uh, big thoughts you want to share let's chat again thank you very much and thank take you care. very much thank you